And if you would, uh, place that offering in the box out the door to my left, to your right, um, with all that information on the envelope as well. This morning, uh, we're going to continue our series, Hot Button Issues. This morning, if you would open up your Bibles to, uh, to Psalm chapter 77. Psalm chapter 77. And as you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit, you know, of, uh, what, like I said, a couple weeks ago, we preached, uh, we saw about uh, abortion and about what God says about abortion and about, you know, uh, how that in a, a God's eyes that the shedding of innocent blood is an abomination to him, that he's not happy with that. But obviously there is redemption for those that have had an abortion. If somebody's had one, God can redeem them because obviously, you know, the fact is they probably didn't know the Lord in the first place when that happened or somebody was pressuring them or whatever, but God can redeem them. But God is not happy with abortion. We also uh, looked at uh, slavery, modern day slavery, and slavery back in, uh, you know, back in early America and throughout history. But we also looked at modern day uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking that has been going on over the past several weeks. And so, and then, uh, and, uh, and then so this morning in Psalm 77, the Bible says, I cried unto God uh, with my voice, even unto God with my voice. He gave e uh, ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul, uh, my soul ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I, I, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest my eyes uh, waking. I am uh, so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the, the years of ancient times. I came to remembrance my song in the night. I called to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart and my spirit make diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be, be favorable no more? Is, he, uh, is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercy, mer, uh, mercies, Selah? And he said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember, uh, remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy works of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O, uh, o God, is in the sanctuary, who is uh, so great a God as our God. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy, uh, thy strength among the people. Thou hast with uh, thine arm uh, redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The waters uh, saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were, afraid, uh, were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies uh, sent, out a, sent out a song, a sound. Then arrows also went abroad. The voice of, of, of thy thunder was in the heaven. The, lightning, uh, the lightnings lighted the world. The earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path is in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts and upon our, our, our souls, Lord. God, that you would give us ears to hear what you would have for your people this day. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to talk to you about this morning and on the hot button issue is mental health. This is something that oftentimes most people don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about mental health, mental illness. They don't want to talk about troubled, someone being troubled or, or, or depressed. And the thing is, is that oftentimes when you look at the great men of the Bible, you become very well, uh, very aware very quickly that almost all of them, at one time or another, had great discouragement or a deep depression. Job was singled out as a man of God, blameless and upright, whose staggering losses and painful illness brought him low. Think about it. Job lost his entire family, all of his livestock, his business, pretty much in a day. He was sad. He was depressed. The Bible says in, in uh, Job chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, it says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are uh, spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is when mine eye shall no more see good. Job was depressed. He, uh, he was one of those ones that had great discouragement, and he, uh, went, uh, he went down into a depression. 
Uh, Moses himself was known as the meekest man on the earth, but yet he was one of those, uh, one of those guys that has submitted himself, one of those men of God that has submitted himself to, uh, to the Lord, one of the greatest uh, uh, in the Old Testament as far as believers, and he had the, the uh, tremendous task of being the leader and the go-to answer guy for a, mil- uh, for a million people or so. Everybody relied upon Moses to do everything for them. He was entrusted uh, to deliver God's law to God's people. And think about that. When he came off the mountain the first time, he was gone for all of, I don't know, maybe, a, maybe an hour or two at most. Came down, and in that time, they said, you know what? We're going to take all the gold that we have, melt it down, make a calf, and worship it. He left them for about an hour, and they were already beginning to worship a false god. So he was, he was tasked with delivering God's word. What did he do with God's word the first time? He was so mad, he took those uh, tablets of stone and broke them because he was so angry at what happened. Luckily, obviously we have a God that provides and, and preserves his word and says, you know what, I'll, I'll, write, a, you know, I'll write my word again. You know, so then Moses went back up again and got God's word uh, from, uh, from God again. But that just goes to show that we can, you know, things can change just so uh, quickly. He also had the Israelites doubt him, or sorry, doubt God, complain to him, attack you know, uh, Moses as well. He also had the, he, he finally got to the point where in Deuteronomy 1.12 it says, How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance or your trouble and your burden and your strife? Moses has that moment where he was deeply troubled. And he was most likely, obviously, depressed in that moment because he was entrusted with so much to do. Elijah himself, one of the greatest prophets of old, had asked the Lord to take his life. And I know this is probably not something that most people will sit there and go, wow, you know, Pastor, this is going to be an uplifting sermon. No, it is going to be one because it's going to show you that you're not alone. You're, you're not, you don't have to go through it. There's other ones before you, and there's ones here today that have gone through a lot of things. David, in his effort to hide his sin, wrote psalms that speak of total loss of strength. He also talked about the gnawing away of, of what he felt was worthwhile in his life. He also groaned all day long in Psalm 32. He had a groaning. Uh, Jonah, the first foreign missionary, became deeply despondent when God decided that he wouldn't destroy Nineveh. He was mad. He was troubled. Jo- uh, Jeremiah was so profoundly sad that to this day he is known as the weeping prophet. And he confessed that he had wished that he had never been born. I mean, think about all these things that these people are saying. These are great men of God. These are the ones who wrote the word of God. Then there's Nehemiah and Ezekiel and Peter and many more in Scripture that have gone through a tremendous amount. Think about uh, Peter when he denied the Lord. He denied him three times, and what happened? God had to restore him because of the fact that he was in such a deep depression about it, about what he had done, about how he had denied the Lord. And so the company of the depressed and troubled is common in Scripture. But obviously we have a God of hope. Amen? And whether we admit it or not, all of us have, you know, can be numbered among them. All of, all of our lips have spoken the words of discouragement and depression. All of our hearts have felt discouragement and were depressed. Every one of us has known at one time or another a slap, a, a slap of setback, a, a, you know, the grief of loss, or a disheartening uh, efforts of stress. To be, uh, to be human is to feel that numbing, exhausting, demotivating fog of depression. And then there, uh, there's a the kind of depression that it obviously is more complicated but because it tr- uh, triggers something within us like a, a, a chemical imbalance in which it, it's almost by a means that they, a person cannot escape that black hole without medical attention. That they've, uh, they've gone so far into it that they need you know, medical help, whether it be uh, through a, a psychiatrist, through, through counseling. And they do, uh, they do need that because someone you need, uh, in some cases you need someone who is trained in that field to help them get out of that. All right? And so this, this morning I'm going to deal with more of the ones you know, that, um, are not necessarily, uh, that don't necessarily need the medical attention part. Because hopefully, this morning, you know, where this message meets you is before you get to that point. And so, like I say, it, if there's medical attention needed, professional counseling, please seek help in those avenues. You know, um, 
and it's not it's okay as a believer to to to, to seek those avenues as well. And then you know it adds a whole big layer and notion. Here's the other part is. Uh, what, are, what adds another layer to it is, is what oftentimes happens is, is that other Christians tell you that you're not allowed to be troubled, you're not allowed to be depressed. That if you're depressed, that something's wrong in your life. Or that you need to just have more faith. Remember, you need to rejoice in the Lord always. That's what, you know, they, you know they, and they try to do it. And one of the other ones is, you know what, come on, you know, you, you know, get up, you got to get moving, and pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mentality, say you just got to go ahead and do this, which causes most people to hide what they're feeling, to, uh, to hide what they're going through. Because if, if they're you know, not supposed to be depressed, they're not supposed to be troubled, they're not supposed to have those feelings, they just sit there and they hide it. They put on that fake smile and they go in there and they just kind of go along with the cliches and say, you know, I'm just happy to be, I'm just blessed. And on the inside, everything is just like a dark hole, you know, uh, to them. And so this morning, like I said, I, I, I'm reading from, I read from Psalm 77, and it is an, an intensely helpful portion of Scripture when you seem like you're in that pit, when you feel like you're in a pit and you can't get yourself out. This Psalm 77 is written by a man named Asaph. Asaph write psalms. That's the only time that you ever really see him in scripture is that he's writing psalms. He's writing songs to, you know, about his situation, about what's going on in his life. And the thing is, is first and foremost, we need to realize that when we are going through a troubled time or we're depressed or we're in those situations, number one, we need to turn, God, uh, turn to God in times of trouble. We need to turn to the Lord in times of trouble. Psalm uh, chapter 9 verse 9 says, the Lord also will be a refuge, a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. God wants us to know that we can run to him when we are in trouble. It's not just about the good times. It's not just about the bad times. It's about all times that we are to turn to the Lord. As we read in uh, verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 77, it says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My, uh, my soul in the, uh, ran in the night, and I ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God, and it was troubled. I complained, and my soul was overwhelmed. Now, what we re- need to realize, I mean, think about the words that he's using here. He says, in my day of trouble, I sought the Lord. Like I said, we need to turn to the Lord in the midst of that moment. He says, well, you know, he says, you know what? Everything that I did, my soul refused to be comforted. My soul refused to be comforted. He said, I remembered God, and I was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. It was like no matter what he did, no matter how, how he still turned to the Lord, he still sought the Lord. That's what we need to realize. We need to seek the Lord no matter what. We need to, uh, you know, we need to seek after him no matter what, no matter how we're feeling. That's where we, uh, first and foremost, no matter, if our, no matter if it seems like nothing in this life can comfort us, that the Lord can't even comfort us, we need to still seek after him. And right away, like I said, uh, right, right away, we hear of Asaph's hopelessness. He has this hopelessness. He's like, you know, I try to do this, and I wasn't comforted. I try to do this. I, I complained, and, and, and my spirit was overwhelmed. I mean, he, he's going through all these wide range, range of emotions. For instance, like the word trouble in and verse 2 describes a feeling of being confined or of the walls closing in. And so there may be some of the, uh, you uh, this morning or some may be watching online or whatever that may be feeling like those walls are closing in on you, that you're feeling confined, that you can't seem to make, make your way out. Maybe Asaph felt like he was in a dark tunnel, and, and that only thing is, is that there was no light at the end of that tunnel. We always tell somebody, well, you're in a dark, you know, tunnel, uh, you're in a dark tunnel. Don't worry, the light of the tunnel is at the end of it. Oftentimes, when you're in a deep depression, you don't see light at the end of the tunnel. So when he, he says, so when he says that my soul refuses to be comforted, he means he tried to shake it off by normal means. You know, he 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 went to all you know what he did, but it wasn't it wasn't working for him. And I can't say exactly what he did because obviously we all deal with. We all deal with depression and being troubled in different ways. We all handle things differently in our life. But he tried to you know, handle it the normal way. Maybe he's like, you know, I'm going to go hang out with some of my friends. Maybe that will get me past it. Didn't work. 
I'm going to go hang out with my family. I'm going to go hang out with some more believers. It didn't work. I'm going to go, you know, and all the stuff that he, you know, came to his mind was not working for him. And in verse you know, 3, uh, he closes with the fact that he says that he pondered the whole situation, trying to think his way through his problems, but his spirit was overwhelmed. His emotion had sabotaged reason. How many times has someone been in that you know, moment where their emotions seem to sabotage what we should actually really believe? That reason that we know for a fact. It was like the emotions that can fluctuate back and forth all over the place. They can go bonkers. Sabotage the reason which we know as that being that solid faith, that firm foundation that we have. And it sabotages it. We said, you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to trust my emotions more than I'm going to trust that reason, that I'm going to trust what God's word has to say. And some of us perhaps you know, can identify with Asaph's feelings, you know, uh, but don't miss his first response. Like I said, in the midst of his battle with depression, he didn't pretend about it. He didn't hide it. He didn't bury his uh, disillusionment. He didn't fake uh, happiness. There was no indication that he, you know, that he went to an obsessive compulsive behavior because that oftentimes happens too when a person is depressed or troubled. They will become obsessive compulsive, meaning that they all of a sudden they, they will turn to food. Like they will all of a sudden become a glutton. They'll just begin to eat and eat and eat to try and comfort themselves. Or they'll go shopping. Or they'll you know, look to al- uh, you know, alcohol or gambling or pornography or any other means commonly used to cope with things. Because they're, like, they're trying to mask those things that they're trying to deal with instead of actually dealing with it. But instead of that, Asaph is honest with God. Can you give me my water, please? I forgot to grab it. He's honest with God. Thank you. He's honest with God. He comes, uh, he comes out uh, flat out and says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice. He comes right out and just tells him. And as he's praying, the tone that he, he has in there is without hindrance. He doesn't hold anything back from God. He just tells him exactly what's going on. Verse 3, he describes this as, I remember God, I was troubled, I, I complained, my spirit was overwhelmed. The prayer was one of turmoil, deep emotion, anguish, and passion. Like he was one that sat there and said, no matter, so he, he was honest with what he was going through. Sometimes when we pray and we're going through these things, even if we're having a good day, we're not honest with God. We, don't, we think that somehow we can like maybe pull the wool over his eyes and say, oh, God, I'm doing wonderful. And God's like, really? You just lost your job. You know, your, uh, your spouse just walked out on you. And, you're ha- He's like, and God's just saying, you know what? I want you to be honest. I want you to be honest with me. Because once we begin, it has nothing to do with God because God knows how we feel. God knows everything about us. But he wants us to acknowledge the fact of what we're actually going through. He doesn't want us to hide you know, what we're going through. That's what got us in trouble in the first place in the Garden of Eden. We try to hold, you know, hide what we're going through. In the Garden of Eden, that's what happened. What do they try to do? They try to hide their sin. They try to hide those things. And here's one of those things. Sometimes when we're depressed or troubled, it's not because we're in sin. Sometimes it's because of the fact that the world happens. Things happen. Life happens. And so for some of us, you know, uh, we've been taught that if we feel depressed or we feel trouble or we question things that are going on in our life, that somehow that we are sinning and that we should never do that. That we are to deny what's actually going on instead of being honest with the Lord. Let's look at verses uh, 7 through 9 that, uh, that says this. It says, will, God, oh, sorry, will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? These are honest questions he's asking. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger uh, shut up his mercies, his tender mercies? He is being blatantly honest about what is going on. Let's look at, you know, let's look at the, the content of, you know, of all these things. He cycled through a wide range, a wide range and you know, uncontrollable range of emotions that he uh, didn't hide from God. He was real with God, but yet he was reverent. He asked God questions, but yet he was still reverent. 
Sometimes people get mad you know, or they ask questions, but they're angry with God in the first place. And sometimes that's the reason why they're going through depression is because that they're mad at God. And that will show us, hey, you know what? We need to get right with God because things are not right between him and I. All right? He is honest yet humble. He tells, he tells exactly what's going on, but he's humble. He has a humility about him saying, you know, are you going to do this? Am I going to continue to go through all these things? He asked the, hard, he asked, uh, the Lord hard, uh, the hard questions that oftentimes depression raises. But we know what? We find no indication that God is put off by that kind of unvarnished truth. That God wants us to be honest with him. That God, you know what, is not mad when we ask him questions. When we are honest and humble before him, he's going to answer us. When we are real but yet reverent with him, he is going to answer whether we are going through. Because why? Because we are honestly seeking his answers to our problem. Instead of us just thinking, you know what, no matter what I do, you know, it's just going to be this way. And it can get really, really easy to get to that point where we say, you know what, you know, it's just always going to be this way no matter what. The first place we need to turn to is the Lord. We need to turn to the Lord in prayer. And let the, the wisdom that he has shown us in this portion of Scripture that we are to turn to the Lord first help us to realize, and I know it seems like, well, pastor, that's a cliche answer that we turn to the Lord. No, that is the honest truth of where we need to turn to. As much as we have family, friends, believers around us, they will never be able to bring you peace and comfort like the way the Lord will. He is one who will stick closer than a brother. He is the one that will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. We need to go to the one that's always going to be there for us and not... Go to those that may say, well, you know what, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. Because you know what happens? Oftentimes, when a person is troubled or depressed, the people around, they offer all kinds of advice. Oftentimes, the reason why is because they are uncomfortable with how you're feeling. And they don't want to feel uncomfortable. So they try to dismiss it. They try to comfort you. They try to say everything and whatever. I mean, think about Job. I'm actually reading, I'm going through Job, and I'm actually towards the end of Job. How many times that Job, you know, here's the thing, when you read Job, just to let you know, at the end of it, God says, what, basically, that what Job has spoken is truth. His friends, even though it sounds good, did not speak one lick of truth. And he has three friends that sit there for, 40, you know, for 37 chapters, Maybe, you know, I would say 30 plus because there's a, a couple times where they're talking about what's going on with him. But about 30 plus chapters giving him advice. And Job, who had just lost his family, just lost everything, in the midst of that, still speaking truth. But his friends, who are believers, that's, a, that's our other part we need to realize. They are believers, but they're not giving them correct truth. And what I think oftentimes happens, like I said, is when people are depressed or they're going through that, people around oftentimes will try to dismiss it or whatever because they're uncomfortable with what you're going through. Thinking that, you know what, I don't want anything you know, to do with whatever. Oftentimes what a person needs is for you to just be there. To let them know, just like God, that you're going to stay there with them no matter what. If they want you to you know, uh, speak some truth in or they ask a question, that's one thing. But sometimes when somebody has a time of grief or they're going through things, only thing they want you to do is just be there. As he, as he admits all these, you know, the, the inner tor- uh, turmoil that he's having and everything else, we obviously know that it, it, doesn't, these, it doesn't seem to bother God that he's asking these questions. He obviously, like I said, he wants to hear from us. The Bible actually gives us a promise in Psalm uh, chapter 34, verse 18, that says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of what? A broken heart, and save as such as, but of a contrite spirit. God says, pour out your heart to him. Whether you are loud or soft when you do that, pour out your heart to him. Because the Bible says that he is near to those who, are, who have a broken heart. 
and are, you know, of a contrite spirit. Number two, choose to redirect your thoughts. Choose to redirect your thoughts. During, the, uh, during one of Asaph's sleepless nights, he concludes that God was keeping him awake for a reason. There are often times where a person is depressed and they can't go to sleep. Asaph concludes that God was doing that in his case. He says, Thou holdest mine eyes waking, he says in verse 4. He says, it says uh, he, uh, he, that he laid there in silence, so troubled that he could not speak. So there's times, obviously, you're going to lie awake, not able to speak, not able to figure it out, but he kept him awake. Verses 5 and 6 says, I have considered the days of old, the, the years of ancient times. I call to my remembrance, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. Asaph deliber- deliberately focused his thoughts on those past times when God seemed so near. He, he directed his mind back to those times that God, that he knew God was right there in the midst. And he pushed back the darkness with what? A song. He went back and he said, you know what? I'm going to remember the times where God has blessed me, where the times that God was there, where the time that God was with me. <coughs> and he remembered the song that God had given him at that time. He remembered those times. There's some times where you don't have words yourself, and there's a song that's going to come to your heart. There's a, there's a time where a psalm is going to come to your heart. A portion of Scripture is going to come to your heart, where God's going to you know, just be you know, a, a saying that to you. You know what? In the midst of all this stuff, God's going to give you something in the, in the midst of that. It says right here, it says, I call to remembrance my song. Don't you love, uh, just love allergies? All right. He said deliberately, like I said, turned his mind back to those things that were uh, thoughts, you know, of times past. That he went ahead and looked at that. Look at Psalm 10, or sorry, verse 10 of uh, chapter 77. It says, and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of my right hand of the Most High. He's saying, I'm going to make my, uh, I'm going to force my thoughts out of this dungeon back to the years when I saw God doing great things. Because oftentimes what ends up happening, when a person is newly saved, everything seems wonderful, right? Everything's you know, beautiful outside, everything's great. We just, went to, we just saw um, an eight-year-old boy preach last Sunday night. It was, it was awesome. He did a great job. But there was a lady there that got saved like in the morning service. And the pastor just asked her a question. He says, how do you feel? She goes, I just feel like a, a, a huge weight has been lifted off of me. Everything seems brighter and clearer. I mean, that's just oftentimes what happens to people when they're newly saved. Everything's wonderful. It's almost like you're just like on cloud nine because you were, you, you were sent, you're, you're going to the hell and now you're going to heaven. God, that God brought you out of darkness into, into his marvelous light. So everything is wonderful. God does those wonderful things. And then somewhere around about three, four, five months down the road, all of a sudden you're like, I don't know if God's there. Why do you think that Asaph goes back to those things? Because you know what? God says, you know what? I want you to remember that I saved you. I want you to remember the times that God has blessed you. You know, you know, you know God's telling you, you know, saying, I want you to remember the times that I have blessed you. I want you to remember the times that, you know, that I've provided for you. I want to remember the times that in the small things, in the little things, and all those different times that I was right there in the midst. Because when we, when we force ourselves to redirect our thoughts, what ends up happening to us? Our perspective changes. Everything about it changes. We can go from a day of feeling absolutely horrible, hopeless, and everything else, but all of a sudden when we shift our minds back, we force our minds to go back and say, how has God, you know, what has God done in the past? And some will say, well, God hasn't done anything in my past. Think harder, because I can guarantee he has. And then in the midst of that, all of a sudden, your perspective begins to change. It begins to shift, and everything, you know, uh, in that moment, all of a sudden, you know, you realize and say, you know what? God has done great things. Let's look at verses 11 and through 12. It says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy works of old. I will meditate also of thy work of old. And, uh, and talk of thy doings. What an important uh, step is that when we feel locked down, 
what we need to do, what we feel, when we feel like we're locked down by depression and all those things, like I said, we need to regain perspective. We know it to be true that when troubles crowd in and, and when uh, and getting up in the morning seems like a chore because there's often times where we sit there and we feel like I can't even get out of bed. Where does your mind normally go to? When you have those moments where you feel you can't get out of bed, that there's nothing else better to do, where does your mind go? It goes back to the, uh, you know, all the stuff that's bad in your life. And I would say be very weary, wary, weary, of those that say they never have a problem. That they're, I'm just blessed, I just can't, you know, and they're always, you know, they, I say be very weary of them, weary. One of those two. The reason why is because they're lying. We're going to go through hard times. We're going to go through troubles. We're going to have trials and tribulations. We're going to go through those things. We are going to go through them. But somebody that says that they've never had an issue, they've never had a problem, you know, yes, the, it is true that we are blessed. The, the Lord has saved us and all that. I'm not denying that. But the, for somebody that always says, you know, that nothing has ever bad happened to them, they either have short-term memory loss or they're lying to you. There's one person that had suggested what they called the napkin exercise, all right? They said that whenever they had felt uh, themselves starting to go downhill, they would grab a ballpoint pen, and that they would go to a restaurant, get a soda, pull out a napkin. Then they would begin to list specific blessings that happened that day. Then, they, uh, then, they, uh, then it would be that week or that month, that year. They began to go back and began to think about all those things. And, these are, uh, and they would go and, and realize, obviously, that these are facts and not feelings. These are things that really happened that God blessed them in, as opposed to, I just felt good that day. They would write down what God had done for them. They would list the top ten answers to prayer in their life. They would list five people who loved them. They would write down the best things that have happened in their life. And regardless of how you, you think about this, you know, some people journal, some people don't journal. But in this case, obviously, all you need is a, nap, a napkin and a ballpoint pen. And you begin to write these things down. Don't think of it as being pointless because remembering how God has blessed you and what he has done in your past can be an amazing thing for you to realize. When you mark God's faithfulness in the past, you will begin to condition your, uh, your weary heart with hope for tomorrow. You begin to pray to God. Uh, you begin to turn to God and pray and ask Him, and you know. And in that moment, you'll say, "You know what, Lord? I I realize all those things that you have done." And in that moment, you'll begin to redirect your path or redirect your thoughts, and redirect your path in life, because you'll sit there and say, "You know what? I know right now that my emotions are all over the place." You know, I, you know and, and you feel like you're in a pit. But when you begin to do this, it's to begin to, to change things and, and to uh, and, and give us a fresh perspective. As we see, uh, number three is magnify God to diminish your problems. Number three is to magnify God to diminish your problems. As I was saying, when we begin to redirect our thoughts, that's what's going to happen. Because as we do it, we're going to begin to magnify God in our life, and it's going to diminish our problems that we have. There's something about the fact of worship, reading God's word, praying and remembering that re helps to recalibrate our, our, our soul. That when we say, you know what, I'm going to turn to the Lord so he can, and we begin to redirect our thoughts and begin to magnify God, all the things around us begin some, so small. They all seem so small to us in that moment, don't they? That worship in and of itself, because all those things I just said as far as you know, whether you put a song on, you read, you pray, all those things, remember those things, all are worship to the Lord. But here's the thing. When we're depressed, when we're troubled, when we have all those things, worship is not our first response. It's not a natural instinct. We almost want to wallow in it for a little while, don't we? Because we don't, see, we don't have a proper perspective. Think about this. When you go, when I go see Brother Doug about my glasses, I say, Doug, I'm, I'm not, 
things are, I, I can't see, I, you know, I'm just, things are a little fuzzy right now. Well, I say Doug's normal response is, well, pastor, as we get older. And I tell him, I say, don't you dare finish that statement. No. But anyways, when I go in there and say, hey, you know what? My gla- you know, things seem a little bit fuzzier and thing, or whatever. What happened? My eyes got out of alignment, right? He goes ahead, puts them on the thing and says, hey, you know what? You need these. You need a new perspective, basically. Puts them on, everything's clear. Our natural response, though, think about it. In the, in the uh, areas of, just say, we're wearing eyeglasses. How long did it take you, for those that wear glasses, to go to an eye doctor? Because you don't want to admit that your vision is getting bad. If you don't want to admit it, I'll admit it. It took me a couple of years. I said, man, I think things are getting fuzzy as they go. I can't be that old. Like Brother Doug says, you know. He helps me keep perspective in that area. But think about it. I mean, there's so many times that I've met people that have, or they have glasses. They're supposed to wear them. I don't like them. They make me look old. That's almost like the same thing that's happening to a person that has depression, that is depressed or is troubled, is that they say, you know, I don't want to put on the glasses of God's word. I don't want to put on the glasses of that song. I don't want to put glasses on the facts. I want to keep them off so that way everything's fuzzy. That way, I don't, that way everything looks blurry, and that way you know, I, I can sit out there and, and go, and, and, and we begin to go, you know what, I, I would rather be in this area, and we don't see a way out. Why? Because our vision's blurry. We've lost that perspective. God you know, tells you, he says, you know what? Remember that song that I did, you know, that I put in your heart? Remember that verse that I put in your heart? Remember those things that I didn't, you know, in times past? Remember that verse? And what does God do? He says, you know what? Put these on. I need to put them on or else we're not going to get through the message. And then everything becomes crystal clear. You begin to see from God's perspective of what's going on, of how God has blessed you, of how God has used you, of how God has done so many things in your life, of how God has redirected. And all of a sudden you begin to see what happens. As soon as you start realizing that, you begin to, to magnify God. What does that mean? You begin to thank God for everything that he's done. You begin to, you know, to worship and to, and to seek God after all these situations. I was talking to somebody the other day. They said that, they, that uh, you know, about four or five years ago, they were in a deep depression. And they said that the only way that they got out of it was that they turned to the Lord. They began to read. And here's the thing. People think that it will happen instantaneously. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it God just snaps it right out. Other times it could take days, weeks, years. And that's what we need to realize is that some people will hear, hear testimonies of how God just miraculously done something and they're going, what's wrong with me? And that will put you further into a depression. Because you go, why does God love that person so much more than me? Why, does, you know, why did God do that for them instantaneously? And for me, I've been dealing with it for years. And what we need to realize is that here's the answer to that. I don't know why God does it for some instantaneously, and I don't know why God, you know, says, you know what, you're going to do it for, you know, go go through this for years. But sometimes that happens. It's okay. Keep your eyes focused upon him. Even if it's the fact that you have to force yourself to do those things. There's times where you're going to have to Force yourself to get out of bed. You're going to have to force yourself to, to read God's word. You're going to have to force yourself to worship. You're going to have to force yourself to do things. Why? Because you know what? If you want to get out of it, God's not going to sit there and rip you out of bed and say, get up. God's going to say, you know what? It's a little, you know what? You get up out of bed, I'm going to bless you. You get out of bed, I'm going to help you recalibrate your focus and your thoughts. You get out of bed and just go, I'm going to help you through it. And sometimes, obviously, if it's, you know, in some situations, because of all the things around it, it's going to take you a while. I mean, think about it. If you've lost a sibling, you've lost a child, it's not going to be like, okay, tomorrow I'm good, I'm fine. It's something that you may struggle with for the rest of your life. 
But who do you turn to in that moment? That person I talked to that said that, you know, four or five years ago that they went through all that and God brought them through it. And they said, you know what? But there are times still when the devil tries to bring it back. And he says, I have to redirect my thoughts to remember how God brought me through that. It's one of those situations and circumstances that, it, you know what, like I said, some never deal with it ever again. Other times, it's something that may last a lifetime. But where is your focus? Where do you redirect everything in your life? Do you direct it back to the Lord, or do you sit there and you say, you know what, I, I want to allow myself to go back to that? Let's look at the, the remaining verses. Verse 13 through 20 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy, uh, thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thy hand redeemed thy, uh, thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed uh, thy people the sons of uh, Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The waters see thee, O God, and the waters see thee. They were afraid, the depths were also troubled. The clouds poured, uh, the clouds poured out water, the skies sounded, uh, or sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lighted the, the world. The earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path is in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Asaph concentrates on the greatness of the Lord himself. He doesn't sit there and think about you know, himself or anything else. He begins to think about who God is instead of all the situations and circumstances that go on in his life and, uh, in verse 13. And he says, we are to meet with him in where? Where are we to meet him? Verse 13, it says, thy, thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. What, this is the reason why we are not to forsake the assembly, the assembly of believers. Because there's times where we're going to be down, depressed, troubled. Where do you go? Go to church. How many times have you met a person that was depressed years ago or even depressed now that does not go to church? And the reason is, is because they don't feel like it or they're down, they're troubled, they're depressed. And they, they don't forsake work. They don't forsake going to the lake. They don't forsake going to visit family and friends. Where do they go? They go all these other places and they forsake the house of God. It's not the fact, you know, uh, you know forsaking the assemblies uh, or, or forsaking the assembly of believers is to do what? It's to bring you back, uh, you know, you're, you do that, it takes you out of fellowship, it's to bring you, and you're supposed to be in fellowship. If, we're in, if we are away from the church, like I said, most people, when they have a problem, what do they do? They turn to other things. They don't go to church. Well, church didn't seem to help me. Or I'd rather be over here. Or I'd rather be over... I am not saying you can't take a vacation. Hear me when I say that. There's times where you need to take a vacation. I'm talking about a person that's been on vacation for 5, 6, 10, 20 years. That's the vacation I'm talking about that you're not you're supposed to be taking. You go to church, why? To hear God's word and to fellowship with like-minded believers. And you know what? Lo and behold, I can guarantee there's probably somebody in here that probably has gone through a hard time that can help you, maybe bring you out of that. God uses people still. Amen? Amen. He concentrates on the, uh, on the uh, like I said, on the greatness of God. But here's also the other thing is, as obviously we have fellowship with the church, where also is the sanctuary of God. Where is the temple? It's not in the building. The Bible says that what? It says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So whereas you go to fellowship with like-minded believers here at church, God is dwelling in you. He hasn't left you. 
It's in the believer. You don't believe me? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When you're troubled, when you're, uh, you have depression, when you're all these things, oftentimes what brings about that depression and being troubled is the fact that you're living in the world. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple ways, and there's an, I'm going to do a couple series on, you know, on the fact, uh, or a couple sermons probably, on the fact of the mind and, and all that kind of stuff. But here's one of the ways for you, I'll tell you one of the ways to stop being depressed, or to at least help you a little bit. Turn off the television. Turn it off. Another way, stay away from people that bring you down. Because you could sit there and you could say, you know, I'm going to bring them up, but you're never going to bring them up. They're always going to bring you down. They always want to bring you down to their level. Stay with like-minded believers. Stay with those that are going to uplift you, that are going to encourage you, that say, you know what, they're going to edify you, and they're going to build you up. Because they're going to help you. We need to realize that God is in us, because why? Because he's never left us or forsaken us. That's what the Bible says. It says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First, he proclaims you know, God's greatness, that he does wonders, and, uh, and his strength and redemption, uh, and God's strength and redemption for his people. Then Asaph then Asaph um, tells of how small and weak other gods are. So obviously he's going through a situation where probably his, fa- his friends, his family, are, are following other gods. And that could bring about a depression. Because you're thinking about it, you're saying, you know, all my family and friends are following these false gods, these fake gods. What does that mean? That means that your family and friends are going to hell, right? Because there's salvation found in no other than Jesus Christ. And he begins to tell them, he says, you know what? What God is great like my God? There is no other God. In in, uh, verses 16 uh, through 18, he he basically throws down the gauntlet uh, at all these false uh, uh, Canaanite gods of the sea, the thunder, the storms. He says, "The, uh, the water saw thee, O God, the water saw thee. They were what? Afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies uh, sent out a song. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightning, uh, light of the world, uh, the world, the uh, the earth trembled and shook. Why? Because all these other gods are fake. So he's going on and saying, you know what? It doesn't matter, you know what ends up happening because you know what? I serve a great God. And here's the thing. At this point, does Asaph sound downcast anymore? What happened? He went from one moment where he was depressed and troubled and had all these things going on. God, have you left me? Has your, has your mercies, you know, are they no longer around or anything else? And what ends up happening? As he remembers that song, goes in that time of prayer, remember those, you know, he goes back and remembers all that blessing. His perspective changes and he says, you know what? What God is there out there like my God? And he begins to basically mock these false and face, uh, you know, fake gods and says, you know what, there's no one else like it. His perspective had changed because worship, the word, remembrance, remembering uh, and prayer and all those things had become, uh, and remembering obviously who Jesus is and what he had done for them moved him from a self-imploded, basically funk, to a God-enthralled declaration of faith. He said, you know what? I know I was there. I was in the pit. I'm no longer in the pit. He said, I'm no longer. He says, then in verse 14, he says, Asaph, you know, um, he begins to tell a God's... It's, I have a lot of science trainers. I apologize. But he begins to, to tell of, of God's miracle-working power. He says... Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. He cites the example of God's deliverance, uh, deliverance for Israel from the Egyptian army through the Red Sea. What does he say? He says, Thy way is, uh, is in the sea, and thy path uh, in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest the pe- uh, thy people uh, like a flock by, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. He begins to go back and say, You know what? Where there's all these different gods, basically God tramples upon them. 
There's all these other false gods and everything else. All these things that are going on bad in his life, he begins to realize, you know what? God is bigger than my problems. God can help me through that situation. That if God did it before, he'll do it again. That if, that if, if he's for us, what? The Bible will say, none can be against us. He begins to realize, you know what, I'm, I'm in this funk and everything else, but then he goes, wait, no, hold on a second. He begins to put those glasses on and says, you know what, everything's in focus now. Now I can see it so clearly. What the devil meant for, uh, uh, for evil, God meant for good. That God took me from that moment where everything in my life seemed so wrong, so everything seemed to be every which way, and God used that and said, you know what, now you know what, now you can go help somebody else. Because you have been brought out of that funk. You've been brought out of that depression. You've been brought out of that trouble. Because God is a refuge in our time of troubles. Finally, Asaph locks in on God's redemption of his people, like I said. In verse 50, he says, Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Joseph and uh, sons of Jacob and Joseph. God cares for us. There's a reason why the Bible says, Cast all your what? cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's what the devil doesn't want you to realize. In the midst of that depression and that trouble and all those things, he wants you to think that God doesn't care about you, that God's left you, that God has what? And the thing is that we know what God's concrete, uh, concrete truth is, is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares. He also says, you know what? That he will give you peace that passes all understanding, not just some understanding, but all understanding. And then he says, you know what? You know, that he will, if you trust in him, that if you turn to him, you keep your mind stayed on him, he will give you what? Perfect peace. The devil doesn't want you to realize that. He wants you to stay in that funk. Why? Because oftentimes when you're in that depression, when you're in that trouble, you are ineffective. But what he doesn't want you to realize is that there are people watching you of how you deal with this situation, how you deal with that depression, how you, and to realize, hey, for one thing, this person's human. They get depressed just like anybody else. They have troubles, but they're watching you because they're like, I want to see how this believer handles this. And when you begin to remember all the things that God has done in, in the past, you, you know, God brings that song back to you. You know, you begin to read his word and remember, hey, you know what, this is what God's word says. You begin to pray and seek him and you begin to you say, you know what, I'm going to believe God's facts over my feelings. I begin to, to think about God's blessings because I want everything to change and all that stuff comes back and we begin to magnify the Lord because of who he is. People will begin to say, you know what, oh my, this person was in a deep depression, this person was in a deep whatever, and now all of a sudden they have the joy of the Lord. Why? Because you know what? The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's one of those things that we need to realize is that we may realize, uh, you know, we, it may go on for a while. It may go for a minute. It may go for a year. It may go for whatever. But God will bring you through. Remember Job. He didn't get his family, he, he didn't get his family back. He got his business back. He got a new family, but God was faithful through that entire thing, and it did not happen right away. Think about Joseph. He had a colorful coat, right? Had his brothers throw him into a pit and tell his dad that he was dead. I mean, I mean imagine, all, imagine your siblings all of a sudden one day and say, I don't like you. I mean, your siblings are going to probably say that anyways because that's just siblings. But I don't think anybody in here has had a sibling hate, you, hate them so much that they say, I'm going to throw them in a pit and then go tell dad that they're dead. Do you think that Joseph was like, woohoo, I'm in a pit. This is the greatest day of my life. And then he was, went into jail and then, the, you know, and then all the kings and everything else sat down there and forgot about him. Do you think he was like, I can guarantee there are days of there are days of depression. There are days of trouble and everything. But what did Joseph do? He remembered that God was going to be there right there for him. It took several years for all that stuff to happen when he got out of there and all of a sudden became second in charge and all those things. What we need to realize, the people in the Bible are not different from us. They are people like us. 
They went through things just like us. You say, well, they're saints of God. No, there are men and women of God that go through the same things that we go through nowadays. Well, they don't have cell phones. They don't have cars. They went through the same feelings, the same situation, all that stuff. Because you know what? There is nothing new under the sun. Amen? So this morning, what I'd like to do is for those that... Um, I like for those that would like, like prayer to come down from, you know, whether you've been troubled or depressed, or you've had those, you know, you're, maybe you're going through something right now. And we just want to believe, you know, uh, with you or for you that, you know what, obviously that God hasn't left you, that God's going to bring you peace, that God's going to uh, bring all those things. And so for the next few moments, if that's you, you say, you know what, I want to come down front. I want to have somebody to pray for me because I'm going through something right now. I'm going through a depression. I'm going through a troubles. I'm having a hard time coming out of this pit. And I just want somebody to stand there with me. If that's you, I just ask uh, that, that you would uh, come forward.